have you ever tried <clears throat> to make something and you're thinking you're in your creative mode you're wondering what do i want to do like for example you've got a wheel in front of you that you would spin and you've got a lump of clay just sitting there and you wonder what am i going to do with this particular lump of clay well, then you start spinning the wheel and you use your hand and you start forming the lump of clay and the lump of clay is shaping and all of a sudden the lump of clay speaks. Why don't you make me into a glorious pot? Number one, a lump of clay is not going to talk. <laughs> but number two, it leads to the question, who's in charge of creating if you're making a pot if you want to make a glorious pot that's great if you want to make a coffee mug that's great if you want to make a bowl for chips or whatever that's great it's so whatever you decide what do you want to make not the bowl's choice it's not the clay's choice whatever it gets molded into it's your choice you know, it's interesting. We, people meaning, look at God and ask God the question, why? Why did you make this? Why did you do that? Why did you choose this group of people versus that group of people? Why did you, why, why, why? We, we using this thing between our ears and behind our eyes, um, have this tendency to ask God, why? We also have the tendency, if we're not even asking God why, we're, we're, we're asking a nebulous why. Why is there injustice in the world? Why is one group of people so angry? And why is one group of people so angry at the other group of people who are so angry? Why, isn't, why can't we just all get along? Great question. I can tell you why. We're sinful people. <laughs> just, it's we're stubborn, we're selfish, we're rebellious, we're downright mean. Everybody is. I don't care who you are. I'm mean, you're mean. Wouldn't you like to be a little mean too? No, I wouldn't want to be mean. I don't want to be mean. That's, no, that, that's a whole other topic. But the point of the matter is, the question of why keeps popping up. Now, yesterday, we took uh, an in-depth look at a spot in Romans about God's choices. Why does God choose what he choose, chooses? Why does God choose who he chooses? Why does God do what he does? Christians sometimes ask the question, God, why are you doing this? Paul comes to an answer, or at least a beginning of an answer for you to somewhat answer the question, why? And some of you may not like the answer. Let's dive in, will you? Let's kind of get into this. Um, enough of an intro. Turn your Bibles, please, to Romans chapter 9. We are going to start where we kind of left off yesterday and move a little beyond that because this section is really heavy, really deep. Uh, it's necessary to take little snippets of time uh, to understand this more fully before we can get to the big, as we get to, not before we, as we get to the bigger picture. So Romans 9, electronic version or, or paper, uh, Romans 9, chapter verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. 
So he has mercy on whom he wills and hardens whomever he wills. You will then say to me, and here's our question for the day, why does he still find fault? Who can, for who can resist this will? But you are, O oh man, to answer. But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out the lump of one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Even us, whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles, as, it ind as indeed he says in Hosea, those who are not my people I will call my people, and, he and her who is not my beloved I will call my beloved. And in this very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. That's the end of the quote from Hosea. We're going to stop there because he's just going to continue to reinforce the same point. <sighs> Who are we to, to know the will and the mind of God? Do you know God's will? Do you know God's mind? Hey, no, wait a minute. Then turn the question back to me. Pastor Robert, do you know God's will? I know what he's shown me. And even then, I know it in a minuscule kind of way. For example, let me turn around and grab something for you. Hold on, hold to this thought. Just wait for it, wait for it. Okay. We've got this. Holy Bible, okay? This, this is a, a Bible that I bought and used for many years. I read this. Some of it I understand. Some of it I get. Some of it I absolutely do not understand. Some of it goes right over top of my head. And then I'll come back, close it up, come back maybe a week, month, year, come back. Maybe reread that same spot. The spot that I didn't understand for whatever reason. Now I get a glimmer. Now I'm getting an inkling. Why? God's timing. God wants it that way. My openness to God. How much more open has after time has passed. In other words, I don't know everything. You don't know everything. The more we dive into this, this is a good tool for us to continue to have God reveal his will for us. But he's not going to reveal everything. This is where faith and trust come into play. I trust you, God. Let's go back to the example of Abraham for a moment. Abraham was told, you are going to be the father of many nations. Uh, check out the number of grains of sand on the seashore. Try to count them if you can. Try to count the number of stars in the sky. That's how much, how many descendants you are going to have, Abraham. That's why I'm calling you the father of many nations. Abraham, in his own limited mind, was looking at him and his wife, Sarah. She could not bear children. How in the blazes am I going to be an, an ancestor for all these nations? He tried to take it into his own hands. He thought he understood what God wanted. Wrong. He did not understand. Ishmael is a great person. He turned into a great nation. He turned into a nation. Turned into a great nation himself, God says. But that's not what I was talking about, Abraham. You got to learn, here's the kicker, to believe and to trust me. I have my plan. Now, I may not reveal all of it to you. That's okay. So we don't know what God's plan, except for what he tells us. And that's what Paul's trying to get to us to understand. God's not going to tell you everything. He's not going to tell you every tiny detail of what he has in his head. Just not going to happen. We are the creation. 
We are not the creator. The creator takes care of the creation. And the creator will do what he wants to do with his creation. Now, does that make God arbitrary? No, it does not. He knows his own will. He knows his own mind. He knows his own goals. He knows his own direction that he wants his creation to be going and doing. And so whatever is created, there is a reason for it. Here's the, here is our final punch for today. In God's will as he is created, his ultimate goal has always been, always will be until the end of the creation happens. And his will has always been to save those he wants to save. Now, who are the ones he wants to save? We talked about this a few days ago. If you don't remember, go back a couple of videos. He wants to save you and me and everybody else. He, that's what he wants. He wants us to believe in him. He wants us to move forward with him, not going our own direction. He doesn't want that. And he is working very hard to get us to realize that our salvation, our life, is because of what Jesus did. Our life is in the hands of Christ. Our life is because of his life and death and resurrection and ascension. Our lives are in Jesus' hands because he, number one, is the perfect fulfillment of all of God's law. He is not an example of holy living. He is the fulfillment of the law, the law that we will never be able to fulfill because of our limitations and our creation and our sins. Then, he is our salvation. He died on the cross. He became the one-time sacrifice for all people of all ages. He forgave us of our sins by shedding of his blood, by giving up of his body. Jesus rose to give us the promise of that new life, to live a brand new life right here, right now, and to be living that brand new, uh, brand new forgiven, resurrected life with him forever. And then Jesus went back to heaven to make sure you, me, everyone who believes has a home. And he is there waiting for the Father to say, it is time, Jesus, for you to return. When that is, we don't know. Even Jesus told his apostles, I don't know when that time is going to come. That is entirely up to the Father. He's waiting for the right moment, whenever that right moment is. So, we live according to the grace and the mercy that God has given to us. That's where we are right now. To try to understand God totally is tough. It's not easy. But to understand God more and what he has for you, this is why I do what I'm doing to help you understand God more, to get you back, in, to get you in line, or maybe back in line, or maybe in line for the very first time. If you're watching this video, and you're watching this video for the very first time, and, and, and you're, you're exploring God, great. Subscribe to our channel. Keep going with us. Try to reach out to me, uh, Pastor Robert at faithhuntsville.org. Have any questions. If you're watching this by means of Facebook, like our page, you're going to get all kinds, all the future references and the like. Let us know what you're thinking so that you can read, learn, mark, and inwardly digest God's Word. Make it a part of you. That's what this is all about. So, we got one more day for this week, and we're looking forward to uh, giving you some, some more insight into God. So, we'll take more, we'll come back to some of this a little bit, but I wanted to get give you a little overview. We'll come back and re-look and re at this a little bit more uh, tomorrow morning. 
You guys have a blessed and wonderful day. I'll talk to you soon. All right, take that back. Not tomorrow morning. Tomorrow's, today's Thursday already. Sunday morning. We'll dive into the Sunday morning. Have a good one. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.